Hello, my quilting friends. I'm Leah Day, a professional quilter, author, and online teacher. And this podcast is all about quilting, running a creative business, and balancing our busy hands with our busy lives. You can find the episode show notes and links to everything mentioned in this podcast at leahday.com. Enjoy the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with episode 21 of the podcast, and I have a new interview with Sherry Shafaldi Morel. She is the owner of WholeCircleStudios.com. Now, Sherry and I met at MQX East a few years ago. She took one of my classes, and this is one of those weird things about me. I probably won't remember your name, but I will remember your face, and I'll kind of look at you going, I know you're from somewhere. I know where you're from somewhere. And so I bumped into Sherry at Quilt Market and uh, she was like, I know you. And so I was like, I know you. And she's like, yeah, I took one of your classes. So she reminded me of where we knew one another and that was really cool. So uh, Sherry was at Quilt Market and she had a booth there and had a beautiful collection of quilt patterns. So definitely go check out her website, wholecirclestudio.com. And that is whole with a W-H. So it's W-H-O-L-E circlestudios.com. You can also check out the collaboration Sherry and I did together. She just came out with a really cute little quilt pattern called Roadwork, and it's a really neat modern design. It looks like a road uh, with a crosswalk. I mean, it's, it's really, really neat. And so she has um, four or five different versions of the quilt in the quilt pattern. You get the mini, a throw size, a twin size, and a queen size. I think that's as many as you get. And so you can put the quilt together really easily and all of these different sizes. So she sent me the mini version, which was around 16 inches square. And I admit, uh, honestly, completely honestly and straight up, I was really freaked out by it. There are times when I can see the quilting design really easily on top of a quilt and be like, oh, I totally know how I'm gonna quilt that, you know, no problem. And then there's other times like this where I'm so in love with the piecing, I'm so in love with the patchwork design that I don't wanna add anything to it. And it's really hard to see that extra layer of texture and design that needs to go over the surface. And so uh, I kind of just stuck it in a drawer <laughs> and tried to ignore it for a little while. And Cherry was really good. She had some deadlines and stuff to meet and she knew that she needed to get her work done. So she was like, hey, you wouldn't happen to have a quilted you know, picture for me to share in my post you know, coming up next week. And so that kind of kicked me into gear. I had to pull it out and get it basted up and figure out what I was gonna do, which was really good. Uh, you know, I can prevaricate on something for quite some time, but when I've got a deadline, that really kicks me into action and that was helpful. So uh, what I was doing kind of in the in-between time between uh, getting the quilt and actually setting down and quilting it is I was designing a whole lot of walking foot designs. And just, you know, thinking through walking foot designs and I've been focusing on walking foot style quilting for the last couple of weeks and just really immersing myself in that. And so along the way, I came up with the design called Split Personality, which is basically a combination of straight lines and curves. You know, you stitch straight lines for a couple inches then stitch curves for a couple inches. It's very, very easy, but it has a really interesting effect over the length of a quilt. So when I came up with that design, I immediately felt that little kind of ding in the back of my head, like ding, you really need to use that on Sherry's quilt. That is the perfect design. You know, that's kind of how my brain works now. <laughs> so I instantly knew that that was going to be the right design to use. So I pulled it out, got it stitched in the ditch, and then I ended up sharing a video on ruler foot quilting. Uh, so I quilted all of the straight lines within the quilt with rulers, then set the ruler aside to do the curves, then went back to the rulers to the straight lines. It came out really good. I'm really pleased with the quilt, really pleased with the quilting. I think it came out great. And, uh, you know, it was a challenge. And I'm so glad that I didn't just kind of set on it and set on it and keep waiting. I'm so glad that, you know, Sherry kind of reminded me of the deadline and I finally pulled it out and got it quilted because it reminded me of you know, the ultimate rule of quilting and that is you're not gonna mess it up. You know, it's A-okay to put different texture on top of the quilt 
and you've got to get over it in order to get it done. You know, you can't just leave it as a fin as a top. The top is not finished. It's only after adding that extra layer of texture and design that it's done. So that kind of kicked me into gear and that was a good thing. And Sherry actually sent me two of these blocks. The second one is uh, very different colors, purples. And I think that one's gonna be easier to quilt because it looks less like a road, you know? Uh, maybe I was a little stuck on the whole idea of it being a road and a crosswalk and you know, very iconic shapes and designs and stuff. So I'm going to challenge myself again with the purple one in June. At some point I'm going to quilt this and stitch it up a notch and really kind of go wild and crazy and try something very different. So that was exciting and I love collaborating. I really do. I oftentimes receive quilts that I would probably have never pieced myself. You know, uh, I have kind of my thing that I like to do and other designers are doing something totally different and it's so much fun to be getting these different quilts and trying out different designs and ideas. So I think I've done a different collaboration for every month this year so far, uh, since December or so. So I'm gonna try and um, get a place on the blog or the website where I'm linking all of these up so you can go see them uh, and be able to click on all of them all at once. So I'll try and get that done before the next podcast episode so I can share that with you. Now let's check in on what we've been up to in the last two weeks. Uh, James just got out of school for the summer. So we're adjusting to having him home and I'm already looking at ways to put him to work. Uh, he's 10 years old and there's already a lot that he does in the yard. You know, we have chickens and ducks and a cat and a dog and he feeds all of the animals and helps to keep their places clean and that kind of thing. But I want to see if he can handle transcription. So I've been working on a new book and working on it in a very different way. I've been recording my voice, just talking through what I want to say in that chapter. And so I have these all these recordings that need to be turned into text and I'm paying for that. You know, if I, if I upload it to a website, then I pay like a dollar per minute to have it transcribed or hey, I've got this handy 10 year old who you know needs to learn how to type. So maybe he could do that job for me. And you know, it's win-win. He earns a little bit of cash and also builds a skill for typing, which I think will be really good. So I think that's gonna be a win-win. I just need to kind of block out some time to sit down with them and we go over how it's gonna work and pausing the audio and making sure that he's accurate with it. Even if I'm making mistakes, I still want the audio to be accurate. So it'll be interesting to see how that goes. I'll keep you updated with that. Uh, James is, you know, I love this age. I really, really do. He's very independent. He, you know, he can make himself breakfast and lunch and has his own opinion about just about everything. Uh, and, you know, at the same time, though, still wants my attention and, and wants some one-on-one -on -one time every day. And so he's always like, hey, when are you going to stop working? You know, when are you done for the day? And I'm like, you know, James, I work until 3, 30, 4 o'clock. You know, I really like to get my day in. Uh, but we can maybe uh, make some breaks for lunch. I said, well, if you make me lunch, then I will stop working and we can sit down and hang out together. So maybe that'll get him cooking too. That'll be good. So another thing that I'm doing this, actually this past month in May, is I've gotten back on posting new quilting designs, new free motion quilting designs. And this is something that I've kind of gone back and forth with over the years. Uh, you know, I finished the 365 designs back in 2011. And then of course, since 2011, I've kind of posted a design here and a design there, and it's kind of been haphazard. And I realize I really miss it. You know, I like to have that goal of having new designs to share and, you know, maybe one design per week. And then I check the stats and those videos do pretty well. They perform pretty well. So it seems like a, another win-win to keep going with that. And so this month you can find videos for um, several new designs. We've got Undulating Oil, which is a cool foundational design. Fanfare, which is a cool spiraling design and clouds. <laughs> clouds is funny because uh, I can see the search terms that are being used on my website. When we switched websites in 2015, it just, you know, kind of that whole search feature became a lot more robust. And one of the most popular search terms that is constantly being queried on my site is clouds. 
So I was like, I need to just make that design. I just need to go in ahead and do that design. So it's here, it's ready to go. And I stitched out lots of different versions for you to decide which one you like best and just to see the different possibilities of the design. Now, some quilters felt like it looked a little bit more like cat's paws than clouds, so maybe it needs a little bit more work. But I think that it's a cool texture and it's really gonna look great on your quilts. Another new post for this month was our free quilt pattern for the May Quilty Box. This month's box was curated by Alex Anderson, so we got lots of goodies from her and her new fabric, Mirage, which is a really bright, cheerful set of prints. Uh, so I love these prints and we ended up with 10 fat quarters, which is quite a lot of fabric. And I wanted to use them up and use them together. So, but you know, all together they were really busy. So I grabbed another 10 fat quarters that I had in my stash and they were all solids. And I just tried to pick fabrics that kind of coordinated, maybe pulled out a color or two from Alex's fabrics. And I pieced up a whole bunch of nine patches you know, really simple, big nine patch blocks. One of my favorite quilt blocks to make. And then poof, I made them disappear. <laughs> so I made a disappearing nine patch. It, it's a really nice throw size quilt. You could make it bigger if you wanted to by taking all of the scraps left over from cutting out the nine patch pieces. You could piece those together and make a pretty nice border for it too, if you wanted to. So definitely come check out that free quilt pattern. It's going to be at leahday.com slash disappearing nine patch. If you've been curious about how to make a disappearing nine patch, this is a great video to get you started. Plus you can download the free quilt pattern and have it there and, and be able to cut everything out. Plus use up a whole ton of fat quarters. So it's win-win all the way around. Another cool thing that happened this week is I was on the Modern Society podcast, which is hosted by Stephanie Kendron. So Stephanie was on this podcast. She was on for episode 20 and talked a lot about podcasting and how the whole thing works. And then I was on her podcast too. So we kind of switched places. And in that interview, I talked a lot about business and how I make videos and how my business works and, you know, working with Josh and my dad. And um, I really go into detail just you know, about what it's like to run a quilting business, you know, and, and how much I love it. I really, really love it. And I'm not ashamed to say that I make money and I make a living because if I didn't do that, I would not be able to do all of these things. You know, I would not be able to uh, hire my dad or offer free quilt patterns or make all of these videos. So I hope you'll come and check out this podcast. I really opened up with Stephanie and had a great time talking with her. She is an all-around awesome person and really inspiring podcaster too. So check that out. It's episode 121 on the Modern Society podcast. Whew, that is a lot of updates and I'm not done yet. <laughs> we are also on episode 17 this week on the Sit Down Quilting Sunday videos. Now, this was a new series of videos I started in January using the Grace Cunique 14 Plus, and that is a long arm, but I have set it up as a sit down long arm. Basically, the machine is in a table and it does not move. And so I'm still moving the quilt under the needle exactly like I would a home sewing machine. Uh, so I created this series of videos mostly because I was curious about these long arms. And I was curious about how they worked. I was curious about how they were similar and then also different from using a home machine. Of course, it is much, much easier to quilt on a machine like this because you've got a bigger harp. You know, there is 15 inches between the needle and the back of the machine on the Grace Cunique. And that makes it feel a lot easier to move the quilt. But, you know, I still do things like I still wear quilting gloves and I still use a Queen Supreme slider on the table so that way it's easy to move the quilt. Uh, I suspend my quilt over the table using my clamp and suspension system. That just helps to reduce the bulk and the weight of it on the table surface. So in a lot of ways, they're really similar. And in some ways, they're really different. Like just this week, I was sharing a video on Hart Paisley. And I also talked a lot about how the foot hops. Uh, you can't stop a long arm foot from hopping. It's an integral function of the machine. It's just how they are built. 
the foot is always going to bounce up and down and you can't do anything about it. That's very different from a home machine where you can stop the foot from hopping. And I've shared videos on how you can break a foot and stop it from hopping. So uh, there's always kind of an interesting reaction to these videos. A couple weeks ago, I got a comment that was interesting. It was along the lines of like, you know, this is treason <laughs> to post a video on a long arm. Like, how dare you kind of thing. And I had to take a minute and just be like, you know, that's her opinion. That's okay. You know, it is critical and that's all right. But the way I look at this is it's just a machine, you know, and the machine is a tool and that's it. You know, I'm not going to go yell at a guy for using a table saw instead of cutting the board by hand. You know, it makes it faster. It makes it easier. And I have to follow my own curiosity. And I've been curious about long arms. I've been curious about using a frame and I've been renting time at a local quilt shop using a frame. So I'm understanding a little bit more about how that works. And I know a lot of quilters are curious about this stuff and want to see videos just on how that transition happens going from a home machine to quilting on a frame to quilting on the long arm and that kind of thing. Uh, no, it's not for everybody, and I completely respect and understand that, and my focus remains on home machine quilting. You know, out of the three videos I'm sharing every week, only one of them is about a long arm, and it's still using the machine very much like a home sewing machine. So uh, I'm not excusing myself. I'm not... Um, I'm not making any excuses here, but at the same time, I am just wanting to make that clear, like uh, curiosity is a powerful thing and you have to follow it. And if you have questions about something and a curiosity about something, you really should honor that. Even if it's trying a very different quilting style, even if it's uh, experimenting with new techniques and new materials, I think that's a really good thing and that we can get trapped in this box of only this counts or only this is allowed. And that's really a dangerous place to be because that's when you start putting yourself in a box where you can't experiment and you can't try new things. And then everything kind of goes gray and dull and it's rather lifeless. You know, I did that with a hobby with my beadwork craft. And I, and I almost ruined the craft. I made it no fun. You know, I had a very rigid definition of what beadwork was, and I had a very rigid definition of what counted, and it was very time consuming, and I just started, ended, I ended up just ripping out everything that I did. Everything that I made ended up getting destroyed for several years, and it took a while for me to realize, you know, this is just, I've made this no fun. I've made this absolutely no fun. And the reason was all the things that I was curious about I was kind of just cutting off that curiosity, like, no, you're not allowed to be curious about that, <laughs> which is so silly. You know, follow your curiosity. There are long arms set up in quilt shops now, and you can rent time, and you can check it out and see what it's like and get the feel for it, and, and know it's not going to be pretty. You know, I'm terrible at quilting on a long arm, and I'm going to require a, quite a lot of practice to get into this and to be able to quilt good-looking stitches. Uh, but it's something I'm curious about and something I want to try. And I can already tell you, I prefer basting a quilt on a long arm way, way more than uh, basting on a table. I, I'm just so kind of over the whole pen basting method. And I found a new way of basting using a long arm, and that's now my preferred method. So, you know, I think that this is one of those things you've got to grow and evolve. And I'm allowing myself the space to do that. And that's okay. And, and I'm cool with the you know comments like, hey, that's treason. Or, hey, I can't believe you're using a long arm and that kind of stuff. I'm fine with that because I can always come back with, well, there are a thousand other videos you can watch <laughs> that I've shared about home machine quilting. Like, go check out all thousand other of my videos. Like, I doubt you've seen all of them. So, you know, you can always come back with something like that. So that actually leads me right into our new exciting announcement this week, and that is our new quilting workshop. I have been working on this workshop for the last two weeks, and it is on specifically quilting on your home machine using a walking foot. I told you I've been digging into this walking foot quilting stuff and really giving into my curiosity about walking foot quilting too. And I love it. I took a quilt top that I pieced 
last month in April and basically went from a plain quilt top to a finished quilted and bound quilt in just under two weeks. And I was filming, so I know that this will project be even faster for somebody else. So it was really excited and I'm thrilled by how this workshop turned out. I felt like I really put my walking foot through its paces and I focused on all of the challenging parts of quilting a real quilt on a home machine. And uh, I learned so much throughout the process. You know, I made mistakes and I shared those mistakes within the workshop. You know, uh, there are a few times that I came inside and I was like, uh, you know, this is happening, dad or Josh, you know, what do you think I should do? And they were like, go out there and share it, you know, be honest, be truthful, and somebody's going to learn from you. And that's a good thing. So that's what I did. So this new workshop is called the Mega Star Walking Foot Workshop, and you're going to be able to find it at leahday.com slash megastar. It comes out June 1st and is basically how to make a throw-sized giant star quilt from start to finish. We piece it together and then design a very simple, quick quilting design. This is really important. I think with any quilt project, you really need to look at how much time and how much effort you want to put into it. And for something like this, this is a bed quilt. It's meant to be, you know, curled up with on the couch. It did not need something complicated or time consuming to finish. So I, I really break down how to come up with a good quilting design. Very simple with three different designs on the surface. So it adds that nice bit of texture without being an overwhelming, you know, dedicated, very long quilting process. So very quick, very easy, and I love the way this quilt turned out. I'm so happy with it. I've had quilts that take, you know, a week or two to quilt, and I've had quilts that take a year or two to quilt, and this one took probably the least amount of time of any quilt that I've quilted recently, and I'm so pleased with it. So I really hope that you'll come and check out this new workshop. Again, it's leahday.com slash megastar. Whew, so that's it for the updates this week. <laughs> Let's get on with the show. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Sherry Shafaldi Morrell, and her website is wholecirclestudio.com. Welcome to the show, Sherry. Thanks, Leah. It's so great to be here. Excellent. Well, we're going to be talking today about pattern writing, writing the process of designing and writing quilt patterns. So why don't you just get us started off. Tell us your process of um, just coming up with your initial inspiration for a quilt pattern. Sure. Um, so I am much like my, many other people really inspired around what I see in the world around me and what inspires me and um, you know, is, is really what's in my life and what I like. Um, there's a, a saying that I went to uh, college for graphic design and have a bachelor's degree in it. And one of my professors said something that sticks with me 20 plus years later. And it's, what do you like? What do you love? What do you care about? And I, that really drives everything that I do. Um, so I just take lots and lots of photos. A lot of my patterns are based on things that I really care about or that are part of my life. Um, and so, yeah, so I do lots of sketching, lots of photos. Um, and then once I decide what direction I want to go, um, go get a little bit more into design detail. Cool. And so once you have your design details kind of drawn out, uh, then how do you start writing a pattern? Do you start cutting and piecing or do you write it all out first? It really depends on what it is. So from my really, and I do sketch, I don't sketch intensively. I know some pattern designers do a lot of it on paper and a lot of the math on paper, and that's not how I work. Um, I'll go into, I use Adobe Illustrator, and oftentimes I'll do a layout or I'll do a number of layouts based on one concept. And then from there, I'll figure out some of the math and I'll do maybe some small scale prototypes. It depends on what the design is. So I'll almost have diagrams and illustrator, and then I'll just start testing out pieces of it. Um, and from there, I try to figure out, break down all of the steps. I'll write them all out. And then I test it one or two or usually five or ten times <laughs> um, and really kind of go through it. And, you know, along the way as I'm making, like, oh, I forgot this step or, oh, wait, you know, and, and, and add in different steps along the way um, to get a really, really great, um, 
great instructions. I do lots of diagrams um, and the written. I One of my biggest goals with pet, pattern writing and one of my biggest pet peeves in general are getting something, instructions how to do something, and you're like, wait a minute, how did they get from this step to this step? There's something missing. Or, oh my gosh, I'm reading it, and I'm much more like most of us um, who are quilters or designers are more visual. I'm like, oh, I wish there was a diagram with that. So I'll always make sure in all of my patterns I want to be as clear as possible. So I have lots of diagrams and lots of uh, written instructions and also tips along the way that I think might be helpful. Um, So I get into all of that. And then from there, what I'll do is test it one more time. And when I'm fairly happy with it, um, I have a husband who is a pretty good proofreader (laughs) um, and is pretty good at math. So he'll also go through, before it goes to testing, he'll read through it, look for consistency, double-check math. He is not a quilter, and sometimes he'll bring things up that I didn't think of, or he'll bring things up, I don't understand that. I'm like, I think people who who are quilters will get that. So it's just great, I think, for another set of eyes to be on it who may not necessarily be a quilter as well, although he's picked up tips and tricks along the way. Um, and from there, it goes to testing. Um, I have everything tested at, with at least three different people, um, oftentimes at different levels, which I think are really important. Um, for more complex patterns, I'll have more testers. Um And then depending on what the testers come back and say, sometimes it goes into a second round of testing. If I think that there's too many questions or people weren't getting it, which knock on wood has not happened that many times, I don't want to rush it. Um, I'll just make sure that it's it's as good as it can be. Yeah, that totally makes sense. So it sounds like this is a really time consuming process. Um, Like your last pattern, just let's just give an example. Do you remember how much time it took from initial design and, and writing the initial, you know, sketches and then to testing? Uh, so the last one, so oftentimes what will happen is, as you know, lots of different projects come in different forms. I'll start something. So my, the one that I'm, I just launched a couple of weeks ago is Roadwork. Um, and I actually did a design for that. I did some sketching for that back in October. There were some other priority projects. I think I picked it up again in December and did um, more of the technical layout, the technical drawings in December, and then just didn't get to start writing it until February, just with other priorities. So hour-wise, it really depends. Like my paper piecing patterns, um, you know, most of the time is spent in more of the actual pattern that people print and figuring out that geometry, the directions, the written directions are pretty, you know, a little bit easier to write up. They're kind of the same, making sure, you know, you attach eight row A to row B. Um, so it really depends hour wise. It really depends on how complex it is, but it, it can be months, but it's also starting and stopping. Yeah, I completely understand. And how much time does testing usually take? And how did you find your testers? Um, sure. So testing, it depends, again, on how complex it is. Um, I find that having, I always have a hard deadline, but I always tell my testers, if you need a couple of days or you know extra time, let me know. We'll work it out. Or if you can get things back to me earlier, great. Um, I usually give testers about three weeks. If it's a little bit more complicated, maybe a little bit longer. Um, but I find if you do any longer than that, it, things just linger, as you know, if you don't have a deadline sometimes. And if it's too short, it becomes a little bit stressful. And I don't want anything like that to be stressful. Um, and I was really fortunate um, when I started um, this about a little over a year ago, I had put a call out to Instagram. Um, And I found a whole bunch of testers that way. And some of them um, have just come back to me. They um, are very, very nice. And they're, you know, they like my work. And they're always asking, can I test again? You know, do you have any projects? So I'll always, again, very nice about it. If they don't have the time because people's lives are busy, that's, you know, no problem. Um, And then sometimes people, um, you know, if there are people who I have been approached saying people will, you know, would like to test for me and depending on what the, where their skill level is um you know and what's appropriate for a project I'll kind of keep them filed in the back of my mind um or in a spreadsheet that I have so um you know I, I found a, a really great stable of quilters um about a year ago and then like I said sometimes people pop up and ask if they can can test awesome yeah that's one thing I I don't do 
I don't test. I, you know, I kind of go through the math myself and usually dad will double check things for me and Josh proofreads, but I have never um, hired a tester ever. And mostly because of the time <laughs> that it adds to it. I just, I'm like three weeks extra, no way. So yeah. if anyone's listening to this and going like, oh my gosh, that sounds intimidating. Uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, this is one of those things where I have never done that. And I've gotten away with it, but you know, it may be good in the future for me to try it, I guess. Um, do you pay people to test or uh, is that something where they just get the pattern for free? I know this is highly controversial. I don't. Um, and um, I, I acknowledge them um, and I do give them patterns um, and we, um, you know, I'll, I'll, we'll trade, you know, like I said, if there's new patterns coming out that they didn't necessarily test for and they'd like to, um, but I do understand it's highly controversial. I do believe in paying people for their work. Um, and like I said, I'm very, I was always very truthful at the beginning. I think it's hard, you know, this, I've only been doing this for a year and kind of as a business startup, it's challenging. Um, and there may be a time, um, especially if they're more complicated or there's more time constraints. Um, the other thing is when I design a pattern, there's multiple sizes people can pick what size that they want. I don't, I'm not like make it with this fabric, make it with this. They get to pick whatever fabric that they, that they like. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And do you ever offer to pay for the fabric or do they pull it from their stash? Yeah, there's been a, a few circumstances where I had asked if they could make a very specific size and if it was like a queen, which it, it's expensive, you know, to do that. Or if I need, wanted them to make it with a very specific fabric, I had pay, I did pay for the fabric. Yeah, that makes sense. But most of the time, I, I believe people are pulling from their stash. Or um, I know a lot of testers, I'll send out, what I'll usually do is when I know that about a couple of weeks before, a week or so before the pattern's ready to test, I'll send a, um, a photo and a description of what the pattern is. And a lot of the times people are like, oh my God, I have this coming up. And this would be perfect for this gift, or I'd love to make that. So it's worked out really, really well. Yeah, that sounds perfect. And you use a lot of prints and then also solids. I've seen your, your quilts and they're gorgeous. Like I, when I came across you at Quilt Market last fall, I was like, oh my gosh, so, you know, this is something really different. And then I actually saw you and I was like, oh my gosh, I know you. <laughs> so it was one of those funny things. But you use a lot of prints in your work. Um, how does that work when prints are constantly going in and out of stock? You know, how do you how do you deal with that? Yeah, so I've been using mostly more solids lately for that reason, or prints that I know are basics um, that will be around for a while. But it is it's challenging. Um, so yeah, so I have been switching over to a lot more solids for that reason. Yeah, yeah, it's one of those frustrating things. That's why I use a lot of um, basics batiks. Because they're, uh -huh. um, you know, they're always going to be in stock and it's not going to be something where it's like, oh my gosh, that particular beautiful, gorgeous print is now gone, never to return. <laughs> and right. that quote was built right. off of it, you know, and that's a shame. So I'm glad to hear that. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sell sales and, and how you, you know, you've only been in this a year, but at the same time, I'm sure you can already see some patterns performing better than others. Have you noticed any trends in that at all? Um, so yeah, so it has only been a year. Um, by far, my buzz pattern, which is the B, um, has been one of the best sellers, followed by Little Fishies. So I could say animals are really, really popular, um, which I know that there's a lot of other um, really, um, really fantastic pattern designers who do a lot of animal-based. Um, so those have been really popular. Um, you know, I think it's so hard, I think just for a year to see what will trend and what not, you know, what, what will be a big hit and what won't be. There's been, um, one of them that I was, I thought would do a lot better than it has, but also I'm recognizing I'm in it for the long haul, you know, patterns, patterns are patterns and people can always make them. And once you make one and even, you know, you put it on online, it's passive income, like it's being sold, you know, the work is all done, as, as, especially as a PDF, it can be sold at any time. So I'm looking at it more for the longer haul, and I don't get too wrapped up, or I try not to get too wrapped up to be like, oh, this month, you know, this didn't sell as well as this, because there's a longer haul. And also th things go through cycles. So, um, 
so I don't, did that answer your question? I'm sorry, now I forgot what the original question was. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're totally fine. No, that's great. Okay. You know, it, and I like that you said it, it does come in cycles. There are peaks and valleys. Uh, you know, like for us, it's the summertime. Things, you know, slow down considerable amount because, you know, our business is online. So things slow down considerably. But then, you know, it's like a light gets switched on somewhere around August and everything cranks back up again. So Uh everything goes through cycles. And I think that's important to understand. And then also one single pattern or five single patterns are not going to be the end all be all. And I think that's really good for people to hear because I got stuck in that mentality when I was getting started, like, oh, I'll come out with this pattern and it'll sell so well and it'll be consistent and it doesn't work that way. Right. Right. And the patterns are almost, especially if you do other things, like I'm starting to teach, I've been teaching um, and doing lectures and trunk shows, and the patterns are a gateway also into other opportunities as well, and marketing marketing yourself. And um, so I sell PDFs online, um, the on- online downloadables, and then I also print, um, right now I have nine patterns, eight of those I have print versions of and I sell um, in-person events when I'm in teaching or in lectures, and I also sell direct to shops and to wholesalers. Um, so yeah, it's part of a much bigger a bigger picture. Yeah, and I love the idea of um, in book writing. It's called having a backlist. You know, the more you produce, the more you have to sell the more you have available so that someone coming and finding your buzz pattern might also be interested in another pattern. And so instead of just a single sale, it's a sale of multiple patterns at once. So I think that's really good to hear. And um, tell me a little bit about your pricing. So you have an online downloadable PDF and then you also sell print copies. Do you sell it for the same price? I do. The suggested retail, I mean, I don't have any control if a shop wants to sell it a little bit more than me, but what I do is, um, And I think this is really important for pattern designers to know that there is a reason why the price is what it is. So I almost work backwards. So I know that most of the the patterns that I do are I'm going to want to do print versions of. So I figure out how much how much money, including my own time, it costs to make that print booklet. So that includes the printing um, the, um, the plastic bag with the Ziploc that it gets put in my time for stuffing, um, you know, figuring out per hour, how many of those I can make. Cause they come back for the printer and I need to collate them and put them in the bag. Um, so figuring out what that price, my time, and also the price of what I have to buy for, like I said, printing bags, that sort of thing, materials. Um, and there's sort of a formula for that. Um, and then figuring out, okay, that's how much this costs. What am I going to sell? Because the wholesalers, so as you know, Leah, um, the you typically wholes- when you sell direct to a shop at a wholesale, it's half of what the retail price is. And then if you sell to a distributor, it's even less of less than that. So I make sure that I work out to make sure all my costs are covered so that if when I sell to a distributor, which is the least expensive, you know, the least amount of money I'm going to get per pattern, that I'm still making money um, and work out those numbers so that the suggested retail for a, the end in the shop is the same price of what I sell it online. Because I don't want to be selling something less on my shop, on my online shop than in a shop because that's just competing and it doesn't, it doesn't make sense. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm glad that you said, you know, talked about that um, a lot of people don't understand pricing structure. And I certainly didn't when I was getting started. And I priced a book kind of incorrectly based on um, what I, I thought it could go for. And then I didn't end up having enough profit to be able to go wholesale or distribution. Just wasn't enough profit in it based on the print costs. So talking about print costs, do you set a restriction on the number of pages that you put in a pattern? Um, so I haven't. Yet, um, they've all been typically about, I think, eight, I think, one, a cover sheet and four inserts. So about 12 is 12 pages for the booklet, plus some, usually there's inserts if there's a pattern, is the most I've ever gone. But that's how I set the price. That's why some of my more expensive patterns, and I also try to keep it, you know, I right now I have, I think three different price points. I try to keep it pretty consistent so that there's not a ton of pricing. 
Um, so I haven't yet, but it hasn't been an issue. It's just the ones that are at that top level. I, my, my highest suggested retail right now is $12, and that's what's fit with those bigger, the bigger booklets. And um, I, I haven't had to go bump that up at all. Mm -hmm. That totally makes sense. So uh, you obviously, you know, your bestseller, have you ever tried to design something similar to your bestseller to see if it would also sell well? Like, have you ever tried to use that data to help you sell more? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, as I mentioned, the Busby pattern is definitely one of my biggest sellers. Um, and so I introduced about six or seven months later, my dragonfly dance, um, sort of in the insects, insect genre, and at the same size so that they can be, um, they can be married, or they can be shown next to one another. Um, I would say dragonfly definitely it's done well, not nearly as, as much as the bee pattern. Um, and the bee pattern is, is really, really special. Um, but I do think, so it's worked out well in this case that I'm starting to do trunk shows, um, in person, but also at shops and because they're the same size and because they're similar genres, they look really nice next to each other. So the other big thing I, I've been trying to think about is sizes, um, so that similar sizes, so that's sort of a mini block. People, can, it's a well, not a mini block, but it's a, it's a small quilt. It's a mini quilt, an oversized block. It's thirty-two by thirty-two. Um, but I also give lots of ideas how. Well, maybe that size doesn't work for you. Here's some layouts if you made um, multiple blocks, how it could look in a bigger quilt. But the sizes is definitely something that I, I think about a lot. Um, my first quilt had one size. It came in one size, and that's it. And now all of my quilts come in at least three or four sizes, knowing that that, you know, people like that kind of flexibility. Cool. And how do you write that? Do you just take care of that with charts or do you have a whole separate page like king size quilt, materials list, the whole nine yards? Usually how I do is the material list um, is on the back. It has it as a chart and then all the cutting. It says, you know, to make the twin cut this, to make the queen cut this, to make, um, you know, if it's a mini or if it's a lap cut this. If there's any commonalities, I'll write those at the beginning of the pattern. And at a certain point, there might be, it might kind of spread out a little bit. So I'll say, go to this page or this step for this size. So I try to figure out how to bundle it together, but it does add um, to the number of the number of pages in the booklet. And that's, again, if I do have a, a higher price point, people I feel like are a little bit more willing to pay for that if they know they get lots of different options. So it kind of balances each other out, the amount of pages and the price point. Yeah, absolutely. This is one of those debates that my husband and I have. I'm always like, let's do multiple sizes and types. And he's like, well, then you're going to want to make them. <laughs> we don't it, need six uh, versions of that quilt. <laughs> I feel his pain. So I'm just finishing up. I launched my road work, which I know we'll talk maybe a little bit at the end, um, my road work quilt um, about, and I just finished quilting the queen size version I made it in a the three sizes in a throw a twin and a queen uh the twin was the first one that got all quilted and got photographed on the cover um and the twin and the queen the directions are good but I want to finish the quilt and I just finished muscling that queen one through this weekend so I get it's a lot of it's a lot more work yeah yeah absolutely and I I love it you sent me a tiny version of road work and we're gonna be I'm gonna be quilting that I can't wait I'm excited to have a mini that is quilted by the Leah Day. <laughs> <laughs> well you know what's funny about that I'm just going to tell you I I had a little bit of design block with it um because of the name and it's it looks like a road and I was kind of getting really stuck on that and I think this is a lesson um that everyone you have to kind of look at a design and accept that that was the way it was designed but then you also have to kind of step back and go but what do you like about it the most and so I think I'm going to go in a really crazy direction with it, which is going to be really fun. I haven't started it yet, <laughs> but but I have these ideas, which are really cool. And uh, and that's one of those things that sometimes, you know, you sometimes you can get stuck on something. And do you include any quilting in it, like inspiration or ideas in your patterns? I do. I always put at the end of the pattern, I write on about the, this quilt and I write, um, sometimes it's just a sentence and sometimes it's a, it's a paragraph where I got the inspiration from, I've gotten really positive feedback that um, makers really kind of like that. They enjoy like where I got my inspiration from. Um, I also include how I quilt. 
um, it, um, just some general, general ways that I went about quilting it. If people need that inspiration, then I also acknowledge the pattern testers at the end. But you brought up a really good point, an interesting point about the patterns. And the other thing with my patterns, which I, when I'm talking with other quilters or teaching, and I'm sure you feel the same way, I put in what fabrics I use, but I hope that people take the pattern and do something totally different with it. Um, I, as I've been making the road work, I've been doing it in three different, very different colorways. And something that's sort of the most rewarding for me is when someone posts a photo or sends a photo or shows me in person one of my my patterns and did it in a totally different way or even altered the pattern a little bit and made it their own which I think is really awesome yeah absolutely the one thing about this and and this is something that's taken me years to kind of wrap my brain around and that is beginners it's so overwhelming to get into quilting there's so many choices to make there's so many different steps and there's so much to it and it took me years to understand why someone would want to make an identical copy of my quilt and when I finally got it it made so much sense to me it's like they want to take the guesswork out of uh, getting it right you know and sometimes if you see that perfectly designed quilt and sorry you're Black, uh, I think it's the one that's uh, kind of a dark gray and yellow and white road work. It is <laughs> perfect. I mean, it's it looks like a road. It's absolutely perfect. You know, so why why question it? Go on ahead and use the one that you know is going to work, you know? So I, I completely agree with you. But at the same time, I also want to say, I get why beginners need to have that fabric, you know, that suggestion of fabrics, because sometimes that is what will make someone want to make that quilt if they, if they know it's going to be safe, if they know they're going to be successful. Yeah, or even not beginners. Someone might be just having a really hard day at work and just want to come home and not have to think about anything, and that's okay, too. So that's why I always include that detail, but it's also really fun to see all the different variations and how I've inspired or kind of kicked off someone's inspiration to make something totally different. Absolutely. So here's a question. You, you'd mentioned that you have lots of extra pieces and things whenever you're, you know, you're in the piecing process. And then you also said that you make multiple versions of any quilt. What do you do with all this stuff? Like that's a lot right of stuff. Now I'm just collecting. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so, I have been starting to book, my biggest thing is being new to this, I want to make sure I have an inventory, and at a certain point, I will be needing to get rid of it, um, so I'm starting to kick off traveling trunk shows to shops to help them sell the patterns, which is good all around, it gets people in their shop, when I saw you at market last year, um, a lot, number of quilt shops asked for it, so I'm literally this week sending out the first trunk show, so I need quilts for that. Um, next Monday I'm giving a lecture, um, or a, sort of an in-person, I hate saying lecture because it sounds like I'm yeah, I don't know, yelling at people or whatever, but <laughs> I'll talk, I guess. So I need quilts for that. Um, so right now the inventory is good, but it's, it's, I'm getting overwhelmed with quilts in my house, but I, I need that for right now. So at a certain point I probably will. I do give away some quilts, um, and I, I probably will sell if people are interested them in the future. Yeah. Like I said, give it 10 years. <laughs> well, like, exactly. I'm at the 10 year point. Years <laughs> I'm totally out of space. I'm totally out of space. And we're, we were considering, um, this, uh, big star when we're going to make a, a workshop with it. I'm still considering it. And, uh, and I was like, Oh, well I could do a twin and a King. And Josh was like, we don't need another King. We just don't just make the twin and be done with it. Yeah. You know, I think it's like the space thing starts to be a consideration and I'm, I'm starting to look at, do I sell, do I give away, you know, trying to make some decisions with these quilts as they get finished. So uh, it's one of those things I think a lot of quilters struggle with as, as the hobby and the craft and the business progresses. Um, mm. So here's another question. Do you offer any free quilt patterns on your site? So right now I have one, um, and it's been pretty um, popular. I um, did a collaboration with Aurafil um, that launched in February. Um, I, they commissioned me to do a quilt that features all 270 of their colors, um, which was awesome. It debuted at QuiltCon um, this past year in February, and it'll be at, uh, at their booth in spring and fall market. And at the same time, we also it was to celebrate their 10th anniversary here in the U.S., 
And also as part of that, we teamed up and I designed, um, it was actually around, it was on Pinterest a lot last year. I actually designed it initially for a contest, or actually it was a, it was a contest, but it was a fundraiser for the Quilt Alliance. Every year they, they have a fundraiser and people donate quilts. Um, and I made a mini with 12 of their spools, a, de a design at actual size. Orifil saw it, and that's how the conversation started. And so we teamed up. To, I redesigned it for 10 of their spools in to celebrate their 10th anniversary. So that's on my website and on Orifil's website as a free download. Um, and I've been toying with doing some other smaller free patterns as well. It's just time. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But I do have a couple of other collaborations coming up. Um, I believe in June where we'll, I'll have a, another free download. So we're talking about a couple of things. So. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us today. So this is the last question I always like to ask everyone. And that is, what are you looking forward to the most in the next five years? So I am really new at um, owning a quilt business. I've been designing for um, over 20 years, but the business is really new and I've led design teams. Um, but I'm really looking forward to really building Whole Circle Studio. It's something that is my own. Um, and I've really enjoyed connecting with the whole community, the quilting community, whether it's um, people I've met that are students or collaborating with other quilters like yourself or organizations and that's just really exciting it's just it's been a lot of fun um and just really seeing how how I can grow in what directions and I'm looking at different licensing um opportunities and just kind of seeing where it all goes absolutely well I wish you the best of luck with all of this let everybody know where they can find you online Instagram Facebook all that good stuff Sure. My website is wholecirclestudio.com. So it's W-H-O-L-E studio.com. Um, and you can find me on Instagram. My handle is Whole Circle Studio and Facebook Whole St Circle Studio. Excellent. Thank you again for joining me today, Sherry. Thank you. It's been so much fun. So that's it for this episode. If you'd like to find more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast, check it out at leahday.com slash podcast. We have a player that will play through all of the episodes shared so far so you can binge listen for hours on end. Until next time, let's go quilt. <laughs>